From London, we present Orbit One Zero, a play in six episodes by Peter Elliot Hayes. Episode One, The Unseeing Eye. In Fleet Street, they say a good story gets its facts across. So facts, it's going to be. My name's Tom Lambert, and I work in a daily paper that maybe came through your letterbox this morning. It's a good many years now since I wrote my last article on the cosmic noise and what followed. But it's my belief that the whole inside story never was told. That was why a few weeks ago I tracked down the man who lives with the whole truth, Dr. Hayward Petrie. I found him in an Oxfordshire village. He's retired now. And we talked about the old days for a long time. I came away with an empty notebook, but not empty-handed. I have here six reels of recording tape which Dr. Petrie lent me. His own recordings made ten years ago, dictated by him, alone in his study, remembering. I've played these tapes. It's all here better than I could tell it. Our glimpse across a weird threshold on the rim of space where there should be nothing but eternal frozen darkness. Yet where there was something more. We're going to hear the first of the Petrie recordings. For the moment, I need do no more than press the switch and let Dr. Petrie and the facts speak for themselves. Ready? Notes, first reel. My name is John Hayward Petrie. I'm a doctor of science, and my purpose in making these observations is to... uh, Oh, hang it, I, I, I can't lecture to a machine. I'll do this my own way or not at all. Now, where to begin? I must go back. Kensington, London. Some years ago, the old Imperial Museum in South Kensington was turned into the Commonwealth College of Science. It worked well, the college. Some of the old vision of empire must have lingered, though, because there was a department to study a new potential empire, space. The School of Astrophysics. East Wing, third floor quite handy for the canteen. I was its head in those days, and a keen crowd we were. It really began on a grey November day in the college's second year. I was lecturing my course that morning. Among the heads bent dutifully over notebooks were two that, with me, were to experience things that would make us doubt our sanity. But none of us knew that then. To summarise... The effects of cosmic radiation filtered by the Earth's atmosphere and observed in relation to botany and geology are understood well enough. But the source of these radiations remains one of the best guarded secrets of the universe. Well, that'll be all for today, ladies and gentlemen. We shall not now meet again until next January, by which time I trust I shall have received an admirably learned thesis from each one of you. Good morning. This writer is back. A new form of lecture shorthand? Hello, Cliff. This? Yeah. Oh, just a doodle. Some doodle. I've been watching it develop for the last half hour. It took me right out of myself and the lecture. Well, if anything, it represents the state of mind of a second-year student with two months to produce a thesis and who hasn't a clue for a subject. Sure it is. Me too. Well, that wraps it up for this term. Do we drown our sorrows in canteen tea? I think we do. Let's go before the queue reaches halfway to Marble Arch. Don't forget your notes, Cliff. You're going to need them. Don't remind me. Madam Judy, on the table? Am I the trade, Bill? You want some hot tea down your neck? Sure. Well, I guess we can squeeze in here by the window. Okay. Have a chocolate biscuit? Thanks. You know, Cliff, it's hard to believe sometimes. That this is tea? Believe me, in no other civilized land do they make tea quite no, like this. No, out there, pending them, with the mist. It hasn't changed in a hundred years. And here we sit in the middle of six floors of electronics. And this is a science college, not a school for romantic lady poets. Now back to earth, Liz. Petrie won't accept a sonnet for a thesis. Ten thousand words. That's a lot of words. And a lot of hours in my bed sitter in Chelsea. And a lot of shillings for the gas meter. You're not trying to get home for Christmas? Yeah. Daddy works for a copper mine. He doesn't own one. He paid my fair hair from Rhodesia. If I don't pass at the end of next year, well, I can see myself walking back. 
Look, if one of us is doomed to fail, Liz, it certainly won't be you. In Montreal, there's no bus right away. My people run a hardware store. So I guess I sweat it out in the college hostel. We'll send each other Christmas cards. And you can take me to see the Christmas tree in Trafalgar Square. You've got yourself a date. Well, well. Now, why is our colleague from down under fighting his way over here? You'll make it, Whitey. Hi, Liz. Got a message for you, two. The prop wants to see you when it's done it. Dr. Petrie? Yeah, be waiting. Don't rub in the wrong way for Pete's sake. Many a good scholarship now hangs in the balance. Dr. Petrie is a pet. Might be to you, he is. There's a difference. We better go, Liz. Thanks, Whitey. Okay. What have we done to deserve this? Nothing, I hope. Come on. We can carve our way through. We had to have a corner table. Excuse us, please. Don't block the camera. <laughs> Come in. Ah, Mr. Boyd and Miss Ryder. You got my message? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Sit down, please. Thank you, sir. Now, I have your course records here. I've been glancing through them. They, uh, yes, they may not on the whole suggest that you're the two most brilliantly gifted students of your year. We don't think so either, Doctor. We just hope we're good enough to get through all three. Yes. Still, you do have something that's rare even here. Inquiring minds. Now, look here, if neither of you are committed for Christmas, how would you like to spend it 80 miles out in the Atlantic? The Atlantic? Well, not afloat on an island. Well, sir, I guess... But we have theses to get started work on. Well, perhaps the two can be combined. I have a letter here from an old colleague of mine. Yes, uh, Professor Campbell McLaren. He's in charge of the radio telescope that three of our universities built between them. The one in the Outer Hebrides? Yes, it's on the Isle of Skara, about 40 miles west of Barra. It's a very powerful apparatus, more adaptable than the one at Ottawa Bank. McLaren's been working there in splendid isolation for two years, studying cosmic radiation. Has he made any progress? Well, McLaren is the least excitable person alive, and that's why the voluble style of his letter puzzles me. However, the point is, he wants a second opinion on some findings. He suggests that I spend a few weeks there and bring a couple of students to assist. You can make observations, take notes... And I will accept in exchange 7,000 words on radio astronomy, but not one less. Well? I'd love to come, sir. I'm I'm not asking what you would love, Miss Ryder. I wish to know if you feel you would benefit from an insight into field research. I mean, yes, I think it would be very helpful. Good. And what about you, Mr. Byrne? Glad if you'll count me in, too, sir. I was reading about the Sky Telescope in the scientific journal. It has a range of five billion light years and can detect the fastest receding galaxy. I'm not unaware of those facts, Mr. Bowen. I wrote that article. Sorry, sir. Mm-hmm. Well, now, I shall be leaving in three days' time. Uh, McLaren mentions November gales and advises thick clothing. I'm purchasing a garment called um, a, a duffel coat, in which I shall look quite ridiculous. <laughs> he does also mention some other work outside the laid-down program. In his own well-chosen words... Some wee back room messing about, which should be right up your street. <laughs> well, we shall see. Uh, please meet me at Houston at 8 p.m. on Monday evening. Right. I'll make a traveling arrangement. Thank you, sir. Fine. Now, I really have a great deal of work to do, so um, uh, good morning, Jill. We'll be there. Goodbye, sir. Good morning, Dr. Petrie. Good morning. Well, how do you like that? Is that character a sheep in wolf's clothing or the other way around? Now and then he gets to be almost human. But not for long. He's just a bit shy, that's all. Shy? Oh, sure, and modest, too. Like your Dr. Johnson. (laughs) Now, come on. We've got a lot to do before Monday. Yes, let's go. The Isle of Skara. A lonely, tilted granite paving stone jutting out of the ocean. Even from the steamer, we could see the radio telescope straddling the highest end like some enormous black crab, two towering pylons, and between them the reflector, a vast upturned bowl. We went ashore at Kirkuish, the only harbour, and the only village. The island's only taxi rattled us up steep lanes and across windswept moorlands where sheep huddled behind crumbling flint walls. It left us at the very foot of the telescope, and then it, it scuttled away as if nervous of the brooding monster it had dared to disturb. The three of us gazed up in silence. The wind whined through the two tall lattice towers. Slung between them in a cradle of girders, the monstrous hollow eye gazed coldly at the leaden sky. Only this steel creature was blind. 
It saw by listening. It was almost a relief to see the homely, white-haired figure of McLaren trotting down towards us in a flapping overcoat. Hello, there. Glad to see you again, Hayward. I saw the steamer put in. That's a big event here. Uh, hello, Campbell. Yes, we were just paying homage to your creation. Rather like the popular idea of an invading Martian. Oh, don't be unkind to it. It may look a wee bit unfriendly today, but when the sun's out, it can look quite pretty. It looks as if it might decide to eat us at any moment. <laughs> oh, oh, my. Okay, well, may I introduce Mr. Little Ryder, Mr. Clifford Bullen. How do you do, Mr. Bowden. So you're the ones he talked into this. That's yeah. right. Glad to have you. Now, let's get inside. It never stops blowing on Scala. I think we may as well go straight up to the signal box. The signal box? Aye, the control room. It's slung up there, just under the bowl. It's safer than it looks. There's a lift. Lift. Oh, we have every modern convenience. Now, uh, watch your step. These parts are slippery. Right. We will. A lift inside one of these supporting cars whirred upwards. We crossed a narrow catwalk where Elizabeth looked down once and didn't try it again. And then we were in a warm, spacious, glass paneled laboratory. One felt still on the ground up there. Until you looked out and saw all the island, the Atlantic below you, or up, where the bowl of the telescope blotted out the whole sky. This is where we work. And this is my assistant, who shares my exile here, Peter Garrick. How do you do? Pleased to meet you, Dr. Petrie. I've read all your papers on solar physics. Oh, well, I'm glad someone has. And Miss Ryder and Mr. Bowen from the CCS in Kensington. How do you do? How do you do? No, yeah. Well, now, you all know the form, of course. We can either send out impulses ourselves and they'll bounce back from bodies in their path, or we can receive short waves from any source that emits them. Hey, uh, how's that analysis coming on, Peter? Is Alpha Centauri still complaining? Yes, quite a disturbance. It's coming through very steadily. We're tracking one of our celestial neighbors, the star Alpha Centauri, a mere five light years away. He seems to be having a little cosmic indigestion, throwing out masses of white-hot hydrogen. I uh, uh, like to hear him doing it. Mm, just love to. Uh, yeah. Let's have the audio range, Peter. Right? I'll bring him in. Aye, there he is. The sound of a furnace hot enough to shrivel the earth, but too far for any ordinary telescope to see. Of course, we're not hearing the physical activity, just the radiations it gives off. Yes, quite so. Uh, uh, swing off to a general bearing, Peter. Let's have the third program for a change. Anything in particular? No, the full orchestra. Right. Well, look at that. The bowl up there is turning, and we're going with it. The whole structure is mounted on a circular track. There are 20 electric motors driving this lot. When we're observing, the whole thing creeps automatically, as it has to, of course, to counteract the air's rotation. Yes, but This bearing ought to give us a fair selection. Just a moment. There it is, Hayward, the creaking of the universe, the voices of a million galaxies. Some of those signals began their journey before men learned to live in caves and chipped flints and have only just arrived. But all that is dead noise, given out by bodies much like our own sun. Aye, and there are more things in heaven and earth. Campbell, what do you mean? I'm not sure that I know myself. Oh. There, you see, it goes on tape and into these computers for analysis. And these pens scratch it out in graph form, mile after mile of it. Oh, you research people have all the fun. I like one of these in Kensington. <laughs> well, tomorrow we'll get down to it in detail. Surely. I'd be glad of your advice on one or two problems. Well, uh, shall we go down? Yes. We have our quarters in those concrete buildings near the cliff. We live well enough, thanks to Mrs. McCutter, our resident cook. She's promised us dinner at seven. Peter, hmm? at eight, will you go on to bearing C-60? C-60? Tonight, sir? Yes, tonight. Very good. I'd hang on to the handrail when you get outside. The wind seems to be getting up. One of our problems is the rain that collects in the bowl. On a bad day, the rain is stuck with such a cold with something like a hundred water. 
McLaren's living room, with its chintz curtains and cheerful fire, seemed that night the coziest place on earth. We might have been in the heart of London, save for the wind and the waves pounding on the rocks below. And all the time we were conscious of that vast steel monster towering into the darkness outside. And McLaren himself seemed uneasy and kept glancing at his watch. And at a quarter past eight, he said, Hayward, I've been doing a little work of my own. A sort of sideline. I think it might interest you. We could take a look now if you'd care to. I, I said I would. So McLaren led me out of the concrete block and we dashed through the rain to another which housed the electric generators. And then down some bare steps into a series of basement rooms. The last and largest was not as elaborately equipped as the signal box, but there were control consoles, a computer in a shiny grey cubicle, and another recording machine, its stylus scratching a jagged red line on a creeping roll of graph paper. And as soon as he closed the door, I realized that McLaren had only been keeping up his cheery manner with an effort. I dare say you're surprised to find another laboratory down here. The universities don't know about this yet. Well, I knew you were keen on investigating cosmic radiation, Campbell, but... I... No, this is something else. Aye. Now, uh, where to begin? Look at that pen, Haywood. Mm -hmm. See the trace it's making? Yes, it, it seems fairly regular. Is, is it something the telescope is picking up? Aye. Then it's on to a certain bearing. What do you mean? I'll put it in a nutshell. A year ago, we noticed that a very persistent signal kept breaking in on our other recording. Uh -huh. We put it down to meteor showers or the like. Then one day, for something to do, we focused accurately on them and recorded them for several hours. Garrick was curious about the results, so we fed them into the computers. Uh -huh. The usual variations emerged. But this time, they were in the form of a regular pattern. Uh, but, uh... No, but that's impossible. <clears throat> Cosmic emanations are either continuous or intermittent. There could be no system. Uh, unless... I... Unless what? Well, I... Unless they were from some artificial source, in, in some way being, well, transmitted. We made more recordings and more. We analyzed, compared sequences, and soon we had no doubts at all. There was form and system. No. There could be only one thing, a means of communication... Soon we confirm something else, the position of the source and the range. Well, if they're coming from some distant nebula... They're not, Hayward. Huh? They originate somewhere on the edge of our solar system. We place the point of origin at a distance of no more than 500,000 million miles. You mean just beyond the orbit of the farthest planet from the sun, Pluto? Just so. The edge of outer space. Good. Well, listen to this. Hear it for yourself. intelligence behind that sound. And I'll tell you something else. Garrick has worked for months on the breakdown graphs. An organized system is emerging. It's a code. And he believes he's on the way to breaking it. Good heavens, I... Of course, any kind of common word language is out of the question. It would have to be some other way of transmitting ideas. It could be figures, theorems, atomic numbers, the linear spectrum. Things constant to all matter everywhere. Mathematics, after all, is a universal language. Just so. Good heavens, I... You know, if we're right, Hayward, this is an event of tremendous importance. Uh, have you made uh, any statements? No. Communication with some other intelligence beyond the Earth. We have... We've got to be very sure. Campbell, this is fascinating. I must go over it with you in the smallest detail. Uh, once we can find the basic key, that's a voice we are hearing. A small voice speaking to us across space... We must learn to understand it. We must. Well, I gave a brief account of the evening's activities to our two young people and let them hear the signals. And then for the next three days that followed, we thought of little else. We spent them either in the underground laboratory or in the high control room beneath the telescope, poring over the neatly filed rolls of squared paper. And on and on went that jagged red line, saying so much, but then meaning so little to us. 
On the third day, McLaren and I wanted to work alone, so Clifford and Elizabeth took the brief opportunity to look over the island. They explored the harbour of Kirkuish, took snapshots, and ended up in the evening at the small stone inn near the jetty. Very good at thoughts, sir. Heck no, that crazy little board, I can't even hit it. But I'll take you on at ice hockey any time. It's not played much in pubs, I'm afraid. Good evening, sir. Good evening, landlord. Usual for you, Liz? Yes, please. One tomato juice and a half of draft. One tomato juice and a half of draft. Well, Cliff, we have walked into something. We certainly have. But nobody sane believes that any other planet beyond Mars can possibly support any life beyond a few fungi and mosses. Too far from the sun. No light, no heat. And beyond Pluto, half a billion miles. There's nothing out there. Just freezing darkness. And nothing. Well, that's what the book says. But let's just hope for the sake of professional dignity that those signals don't turn out to be mixed up dance music from Radio Istanbul or somewhere. Somehow, I don't think they will, Cliff. Neither do I. There's something about that noise that gave me the creeps around the back of my neck. One tomato juice and a half of draft. That will be one in Naples, please, sir. Right. One and nine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, cheers. Cheers. The young lady and yourself will be concerned with the contraption, no doubt. That's right. Hey, just listen to that wind out there. Landlord, are there ever days here when you could keep a hat on? Oh, yes. But this is the third winter, so there will be bad weather. The third winter? What's that? It is the time when the Kirkuish monster visits us. The Kirkuish monster? It is a fisherman's story. It is said the sea monster returns to Skara every third year and swims round it, bringing ill weather and driving off the fish. Have you seen him? Or does he only appear when no one's looking? It is a story. They say the place to watch from is Drumaird Point on the north of the island. No, I cannot say that I have seen the monster. But then, I cannot say that I have. Well, I think it's time we were getting back here. Okay, Liz. Good night, landlord. Good night, sir. Good night. We'll look out for the monster. Aye. Seamus. Aye. I have been wondering. Are the dead fish being washed in again? Yes. I had heard that they were. I saw McFerrin's point. There was no hard proof. We might cause a sensation and then have to admit to chasing a theory. But the proof then was closer than any of us imagined. It was nearly a week later on a grey afternoon when Clifford and Elizabeth were following a cliff path on the north side of the island. This is the mad point. Goodness, it's bleak and lonely. Yeah. Just the rocks and the cold grapers falling in from the Atlantic. Up here, you could almost start believing those fishermen thought it. Now, Liz, you really believe that's the scientific approach? Well, it's supposed to be our inquiring minds that got us here. I just happen to have a little imagination as well. Well, my imagination never works so good with my ears half frozen off. <laughs> oh, poor old Cliff. Cliff? Yeah. Look there. Where? Look at the sea. Just beyond the last of those rocks, where all the gulls are gathering. There's a big circle of foam. Hey, you're right, there is. Must be a couple of hundred yards across. The water's all churned up. Almost looks like it's boiling. Which today, I would say, is unlikely. Did you hear that? Yeah. And I felt it through the rock we're standing on. I'm sure it's coming from out there. That's quite some disturbance. Can't be volcanic, not here. 
Hey, and get a look at those waves coming in. Those gulls, Cliff. Which fish are they diving for? They're snatching them from the surface. They look as if they're dead ones. Yeah, they sure do. Hey, Liz. You know, that spot isn't, isn't far below the tide line. And the tide's going out. Now, I reckon it'll be uncovered in another hour. Oh. We could walk out to it. Sure, let's do that. Let's stay around for a while and do it. This was just about the place. But there's not a thing here now. Just firm, wet sand. And the gulls have gone. I've never seen such a lonely place. What could it have been, Cliff? Oh, maybe just an eddy, some freak local current. But there seemed to be force there. Something pretty powerful. Well, my feet are getting wet, so let's go. Hey, hold it. Can you hear that, Liz? It's a kind of humming. Yes. It's underneath the sand. I'm sure it is. Look. It's vibrating the seawater in that pool. Claire, what is it? Well, I need more than three guesses. If it's something that hums, this is some place for it to be. Hey. The sand is soft enough. It wouldn't take as long to scoop a hole. What with? Hands, girl, hands. The best tools in the world. Only four are better than two. All right. Cliff, you don't suppose we could be teasing an old mine, do you? No. Uh, mine's rust up. It could be we're sitting on top of something else. The lair of the Kakuish monster. Had you thought of that? the hole bigger, it fills up with water. I'm getting soaked. We need spade. Well, it can't be down so deep. Try and keep going, Liz. Oh, there goes a nail. Cliff, I broke it on something hard. Hey, I just let the sand settle. Yeah, do you see it? There's some kind of curved edge. Let me get down there. It goes down quite a way. It looks like a circular metal plate. It's covered with tiny shellfish. Yeah, marine crustacea. Sea deposit. Must have been submerged for years. Now we're getting to it, Liz. You feel that vibration? The thing's going like a dynamo. Cliff, don't touch it anymore. I don't like it. You can see what it is now, can't you? Yeah, I guess so. The end. It's about three feet across, and it runs quite a way under the sand. It's a cylinder. An enormous, great cylinder. That was Orbit One Zero, a play in six episodes written by Peter Elliot Hayes and produced for the BBC by David Davis.